On the show today, we bring you stories from the ball field. From a friendship that changed Mickey Mantle's life to an African missionary turned pro ball player, we bring you inspirational stories from the diamond. And it all starts right now on this edition of Game On. up welcome to game on thank you so much for watching and i hope you brought your glove this week because today we're talking all about the grand old game of baseball yeah that's right we bring you inspirational stories from the baseball diamond from mickey mantle's greatest decision to a missionary kid turned pro but we first start off with a man who discovered one of today's biggest stars yeah that's right you know if you follow baseball at all you know that mike trout is one of if not the best player in the game even with some injury problems this year, there's still no questioning his greatness. But what you may not know about the Trout story is that it involves a former Liberty Baseball assistant coach turned big league scout named Greg Moorhart. It would be Moorhart who had signed this once-in-a-generation player, but only after God first brought him through the valley. All Greg Moorhart ever wanted to be was a Major League Baseball player. Get the big hop. There you go. But as it turned out, instead of being a star... Good pick in he would end up finding one. Watch the hop, that a boy. In the early 1980s, Moorhart attended South Carolina where he became one of the nation's top ball players and had pro teams taking notice. As college went on, it was really just about the draft. I figured, hey, if I do really good at this, I could probably go in the first round. That prediction wasn't far off as Moorhart would be selected in the second round of the 1984 draft by the Minnesota Twins. In his mind, he was on his way to the bigs. But God's plan was a little bit different. I think it was a time when uh, God was probably just taking idols away from me, you know, and baseball being one of them. I think that I had enough ability to play Major League Baseball, but God in his mercy allowed me not to. And so after a tumultuous six seasons in the minors, Greg Moorhart's playing days would come to an end at the age of 25. For me, all I can say for me is I kind of train wrecked it myself. And I think it was in a strange way of trying to get God's attention. Um, I think above all things, people want to know that God loves them. No matter what. No matter if you're good at what you do, bad at what you do. Um. So I think I was just trying to settle that. You know? and, uh, and if baseball had to be the lamb, then it had to be the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. For, I, I had to, it had to kind of die first, you know? His role as a player may have been over. But as for the part he would play in the game of baseball, there was still much to be written. And so, after getting his life right with God, Moorhart moved into a job he had never wanted. Never thought, in fact, I told my mom, I said, one thing I'll never do is scout And when I was playing, I'm not, you know? And it's an amazing thing how, like, we say such arrogant statements and God, like, will remind us how arrogant we are. Armed with his experience as a player, Moorhart began scouting for the Mets and then the Angels. And it was with the Halos that a memory of an old teammate led him to a new talent. Jeff Trout and I played together in 1984. When I signed, he was already on the team as a second baseman. And it was probably, what, 16 years, 17 years later, we're getting this East Coast Pro Showcase team together. I'm talking uh, with one of the other scouts. And, uh, and he was talking about, oh, this, this kid Trout from South Jersey, he can really run. I'm thinking, you know, and then, ah. I called the guy back a few weeks later. I said, Does his father, did his father play minor league baseball? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he said, and he said, Jeff, I go, that's gotta be, that's gotta be his kid. The kid was Mike Trout. And with one look, Moorhart knew he was special. He looks like a, like Mickey Mantle, kinda, you know? A strong, fast, really good attitude. Just, just a great instinctive athlete. And this kid's gonna be a big league player. Moorhart was more convinced than most about Trout's talent, and after getting his bosses with the Angels to buy in, they just hoped he would be available when the team selected in the first round of the 2009 draft. We got picked 24 and 25 in the first round, and, uh, 
you're hoping because of maybe some weather conditions, maybe guys didn't get as good a look at them in the summer, maybe teams will take, they don't want to take high school, play, whatever the reason is. And you're just hoping that somehow Mikey slips to 24, 25, where we can take him. He would fall to pick 25, and that's where the Angels snagged him. With that pick, they got the game's next superstar, thanks in large part to more hard scouting. A walk-off big fly for Mike Trapp. Light that baby up. And now, you can't Google Greg Moorhart's name without seeing him linked to Mike Trout. You have to have your name attached to a player, not just a talented player, but a, uh, a young man that does a lot of very, very nice things and kind things for people and he's um, and carries himself in the way he does. He's a, a terrific person to have your name pull up with. These days, Morehart is now scouting for the Atlanta Braves on the lookout for the next player to pique his interest. It may not be the baseball career he envisioned all those many years ago, but it is the one God has called him to. And a Morehart following God's plan is the most rewarding career he could ever have. If God allows me to see that a player is a little more talented or um, whatever it is, and, it, and through the scouting, I have success with the club that I'm with, I'm very, you know, I'm very thankful for that. And if eventually it brings God glory uh, through the scouting, then amen. Yeah, I mean, I think it takes an awful lot of faith to be a scout. You think about it, you're going on the road all the time. You're looking here and there, trying to find the next generational talent. And when you're not finding it and you're struggling, I'm sure it can get extremely frustrating, but obviously he has faith in his ability, but also when you have faith in the Lord, I'm sure it's very helpful. Absolutely. You know, most guys go their entire careers in scouting without finding even one guy close to the to talent level that Mike Trout is. But God blessed Greg Moorhart in his profession and certainly in his personal life as well as he found that guy and he continues now to share that story and it's a way for him to share Christ yeah, as well. Absolutely. Well, some more great stories from the baseball diamond. Liberty has had its share of guys make it to the big leagues over the years. Sid Bream, Randy Tomlin, for instance. And then there was the career of Southpaw pitcher Lee Guterman. More than a decade in the bigs. His love of the game continues to this day. And now he's trying to pass on that same love for the game to the next generation. Okay, I'm going to time you on this one. It's Saturday morning at the East Tennessee Baseball Training Facility in Lenore City, Tennessee. Get the leg kick higher and get out there as far as you can. And pitching coach Lee Guterman like is helping develop a young right-hander. Okay. So it almost touches right there. If Lee sounds like he knows a little bit about pitching. Do the figure eight in your mind. That's because he does. That was good. The left-hander pitched 11 seasons in the majors and he played on four different teams. I like playing in all of the places because I just love playing. But he says New York was his favorite. When you're in a place long enough, it, it does become like home. And I was longer there than any other one place. Lee pitched against some of the best hitters in baseball. And he says Hall of Famer Wade Boggs was the toughest at first. The book on him was Off Speed Away. Well, I would throw Off Speed Away and he would hammer it. <laughs> After two years of that, I said, you know what, I'm done. I ain't following the book anymore. So I didn't. I threw my sinker, my number one pitch, and he hit a ground ball shortstop. I just went, whoa. The next time up, you know what I did? I threw him a sinker. You know what he did? He hit a ground ball shortstop. I thought, you know what, I figured something out here. For Lee, that moment happened in a matter of seconds but it was years in the making. Unlike the young players he coaches, Lee's first coach was not a former professional pitcher. I had my dad. I mean, he did a pretty good job. What he did was he created this box, a strike zone, on sticks and put a screen behind it and a, bu and a bucket of balls. He said, when you get 10 in a row inside the box, tell me. And he would walk off. <laughs> The training helped. In high school, Lee earned all state honors in California. And when it came time for college, dad would put pen to paper. My dad wrote a letter to Liberty University. Al Worthington called a scout he knew who was covering our area, and he told him to sign me. And so he called back and said, I'm offering you a full ride over the phone. Just like that. But once arriving at Liberty, Lee had a change of heart. 
After two weeks, I called my dad. I said, no, no, this is true. I called my dad. I said, Dad, I don't know if this place is for me. He said, son, I promised to get you there. And I'd done that. I said, if you want to come home, that's on you. I just, what? <laughs> Lee stayed at Liberty, and he says he grew physically, mentally, and spiritually. What I had as far as what I thought was salvation was fire insurance. And because of the pouring out of the gospel and the pouring out of spiritual emphasis at Liberty, I came to the realization that I didn't have Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I was looking for fire insurance when I was young. So I made that commitment at Liberty and it changed my life. Lee's faith in God would help him throughout his career, but especially when his playing days were over. When I quit, I mean, I was, I was still searching for teams to play for. They had to take the uniform away from me, you know. It wasn't like I'm tired of this, I'm done. No, not at all. When I was all done playing, I said, Lord, if this is not something you want me to be involved in, please take this passion away. And he never took it away. So I said, okay, I'm going after this. So you got good speed. And so I started teaching it. Exaggerate this part so we're on it longer, and this part so we touch it better. I'm still very passionate about the game. I love it. I love watching young guys learn it and do well, and they get that big smile, you know, of accomplishment. Good job today. Coming up from the mission field to the ball field, see how one young man made the journey from Africa to pro baseball. And Mickey Mantle seemingly had everything, fame, talent, but it would be his friend that helped him find the most important thing. That's when Game On returns. Anyone who may be doubting being able to go back to school or doing online and having time, I would say LU Online is the best way to go. I'm 31, this was my fourth degree. You can get it done. I changed jobs in the middle of it. It's possible, especially if you do have to work, because so many of us today, we don't have the means to not work and go to school. And I feel like LU Online allows time and the flexibility to do what you need to do in life and in work while getting your degree. The actual online portion gave me an opportunity to be able to be the husband and the, and the father and then get online and be the student in the evenings. We're all so busy in our today life. I think the online option provides an avenue to success and it provides 
an avenue to, you know, being able to have uh, the opportunity to go back to school with its flexibility and its schedule. Welcome back to Game On. On today's show, we're focusing on stories from America's favorite pastime, baseball. And yet this next story begins in Africa, where baseball is far from the favorite pastime. It was there on the mission field that a young boy first dreamt of playing pro baseball, a dream he's now living every day. Daniel Salter's childhood was a little different than most. I was five years old and uh, my, my parents just kind of felt the calling to uh, move overseas, packed up the whole family and moved to Kenya. You know, looking back on it for my parents, that's a pretty big decision, um, but they really, you know, follow, followed what they felt the Lord was calling them to do. They would follow that calling for the next eight years. Daniel's father, John, would use his skills as a pilot, serving missionaries in hard to reach locations, while he and the rest of the family devoted their lives to spreading the gospel to the African people. Some of my favorite memories were getting to go on game drives out in the safari or whatever, just out in the middle of nowhere, see, you know, lions and elephants and all that. Hi, Daniel. Nice to see you. What wasn't really a part of Daniel's life during his time in Africa was the sport of baseball. I'd go out with my dad sometimes in the backyard and we'd hit the wiffle ball. Um, but other than that, you know, I always loved baseball and always wanted to play. But yeah, honestly, more over there was just soccer. But as Daniel's mother found out one night, just because he couldn't play baseball in Africa didn't mean he wasn't dreaming of a future in the game. I was saying goodnight to Daniel. He was in his mosquito net, and we had a big net that I could come inside, and I was praying with him. We were talking about what he wanted to do when he grew up, and he said he wanted to be a professional baseball player. And I remember talking to the Lord. I'm not sure how that's going to happen because there's no baseball in Africa. Daniel's opportunity to play wouldn't come until the age of 14, when his family moved back to Oklahoma. Once back in the States, he quickly realized his skills on the diamond weren't quite where they needed to be. Man, I was I was not very good first couple of years in high school, and it kind of took me a little while to catch up to the other kids. Time and a little extra help from his dad. Usually my dad would pick me up uh, at lunch in high school. He'd, you know, we'd have 20, 30 minutes, and he'd pick me up, we'd pack lunch, we'd go down to the, uh, to the batting cages down by the lake, and we'd eat our lunch and then hit. Those lunchtime BP sessions paid off as Daniel's talent began to catch up with his passion. After playing two seasons at a junior college, he was signed with Division I Dallas Baptist, eventually being drafted by the Cleveland Indians. A lot has gone right for Daniel Salters, and he believes those years spent as a missionary in Africa have helped him to appreciate the success he enjoys today. Looking back now, it really gave me a kind of different perspective on life and like how we live here in America. We're, we're totally blessed and seeing people over there with literally absolutely nothing sleeping on the on the roads and streets just the poverty it, it really kind of for me gave me a different perspective of just realizing like how much the lord has blessed me as a catcher daniel has a unique view of the game similarly he now has a unique view of his role as a pro athlete much like his childhood in africa he still sees himself as a missionary baseball there is a, it's a huge mission field. Not many other jobs, he's surrounded by a bunch of, bunch of guys almost 24 seven for us, you know, months and months at a time. Like, there's a lot of guys that, um, you know, that are maybe struggling that, that um, you can really have opportunities to share Christ. Because baseball's tough, and if your hope and joy isn't in the Lord, like, it can definitely bring you down at times. But, you know, it's, a, it's an awesome mission field, and I know the Lord can definitely use me in it. The missionary kid turned pro ball player. Most would view a career in the big leagues as the happy ending to this story. But once again, Daniel's perspective is a little different than most. Obviously, like, I, I would love to play in the big leagues. That's my, that's my goal. That's what I'm striving for. I want to continue to do well and get moved up. Uh, but in the end, like, only what's done for Christ is going to matter. Baseball is going to be over before I know it. And so it's not going to leave me like satisfied. Only satisfaction comes from the Lord. So for me, um, my, my prayer and my goal is that every day like I'm going out and I'm playing for the Lord, for His glory, and kind of just leaving the results on the field. 
You know what, what I love about this story is he's a little kid in Africa, tells his mom, I want to be a pro baseball player. A lot right. of parents would be like, you live in Africa. That's not happening. Pick a different dream. But his mom <laughs> takes that to God, yeah. prays about it, and it just points to the faith that this family has. I think it goes on God as well. If you have a desire, heart's desires, to be a pro professional baseball player and you're in Africa, he's going to take care of you. He loves you, and he's, he's loyal to your heart's desires. Best interest at heart, no doubt about that. Well, hey, still to come, Mickey Mantle was one of the greatest players to ever play the game of baseball, but we bring you the story of a friendship that made the biggest difference in his life. Stick around. Game On's coming right back. Meet William Byron, Liberty University student and Xfinity Series driver of the number nine Chevrolet. Since William was a child, he dreamt of racing. His continued partnership with Liberty University means he's able to pursue his college degree while chasing the checkered flag. Look for William Byron and the Liberty University number nine Chevrolet on race day during the Xfinity Series this season. So you've chosen Liberty University. What's next? Well, you could study here. Or here. Or way out here. You could build this. Catch that. Or play this. Sure, you'll have early mornings. Long days. And some longer nights. But that's how we grow. No matter who you are, where you live, or what you want to do, your education starts here. Liberty University, the world's largest Christian university. Want to come visit us? Well, you're in luck. Homecoming is a perfect opportunity for alumni, families, and newcomers to participate in the game day experience. At College for a Weekend, you get to hear from speakers, go to classes, and attend our weekend concert. Ring in the new year with us at Winterfest. Spend the day snowboarding at Snowflex, rock climbing, or at the artist Q&A, then rock out at night with the top Christian artists. With so many ways to visit our campus, why aren't you here already? You have learned not just how to make a living, but also how to live. You have learned from the teachings of Jesus to live your lives by the great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbors as yourselves. Liberty's mission is to train young people to succeed in every profession and to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The more people tell you it's not possible, that it can't be done, the more you should be absolutely determined to prove them wrong. Treat the word impossible as nothing more than motivation. As long as you have pride in your beliefs, courage in your convictions, and faith in your God, then you will not fail. You know, Mickey Mantle is a legendary figure in the game of baseball. There are countless stories about Mantle's exploits on and off the field. But it would be a friendship with fellow Yankee Bobby Richardson that would bring about a happy ending to the story and give Mantle peace at the end of his life. Former New York Yankee second baseman Bobby Richardson played alongside many of baseball's greats, but it was Mickey Mantle who first showed him the ropes. He said, come over here, kid. I don't think he even knew my name at that time. He said, I'm gonna make like I'm showing you around Yankee Stadium and I promise you there'll be a photographer over here in just a minute and you'll be headlines in the paper tomorrow. He came over and he was pointing like this and that showed me the stadium. Three or four photographers came over like that and the next day had our picture in the paper and we became long, long friends. A strong Christian himself, Bobby always made it a point to invite Mantle to the team's chapels. I said, Mickey, Mickey, uh, we're having chapel in such and such a room at such and such time. He said, oh, you know me, I'll be out late last night. I probably won't even be up. He'd come in the next day, have his suit on and be right there. And we just had a great relationship. 
Away from the diamond, Bobby and his wife Betsy were close with the Mantles. They shared a vacation home together and always took the opportunity to share their faith. I remember that he was to get on a helicopter and fly to Charlotte and from Charlotte elsewhere. The weather was real bad and he looked over at Betsy and he said, Betsy, let's you and I and Bobby go and read the scriptures and let's have prayer together before I get on that helicopter. Even after their playing days ended, Mantle and Richardson remained close. Mickey even offered up his help when Bobby was the head coach at the University of South Carolina. He came down and gave a betting exhibition. This was one year after he retired. I don't think he'd do that for anybody. And then he signed about 100 bets. And one more time, we talked about the need to say yes to Christ and receive his Savior. Mickey battled alcoholism for most of his life and endured the loss of two of his children. But even after getting sober and getting his life on track, he still longed for something more. There was a poignant interview on national television where Bob Costas interviewed Mickey Mantle. And Mickey Mantle went on to say how he'd been through Betty Ford, he didn't drink anymore. And then it took so much courage for him to do what he did next. He, in front of a television audience nationally, said, I haven't been a good husband, I haven't been a good father. And he said, I'm no hero. And then he said, but I still have a void in my heart. But that void would soon be filled as all those seeds Bobby had planted over the years finally began to take root. My phone rang at five o'clock in the morning. It was Mickey. Betsy answered the phone and Mickey said, Betsy, I'm really hurting. I'm waiting for a liver transplant at Baylor Medical Center. I'm in the midst of chemotherapy. I want Bobby to pray for me. And I remember that um, I got on the phone and I shared a verse with Mickey. It's Philippians 4, but I use a Phillips translation. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. Find your joy in Him at all times. Never forget His nearness. And then it says, tell God in detail your problems, your anxieties, and the promise is the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds as we rest in Christ Jesus. Betsy went out and spent the next two days with Merlin, his wife, and Mickey and I visited together. Wasn't too long after that, a couple of weeks perhaps, and the call came. He'd taken a turn for the worse. Cancer had come up in the transplant that he had. And uh, his family wanted Betsy and I to come and be with him. I remember that we got on a plane and uh, immediately I wanted to be bold one more time because I wanted him to spend eternity with me in heaven. And then I let Betsy off at the home we're staying in in Dallas and went to Baylor Medical Center. Three of his teammates had just left. and I remember walking in, he had a smile on his face. And he said, come over here, I can't wait to tell you this. He said, I want you to know I'm a Christian. I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I remember crying a little bit and then I said, Mickey, let me go over it with you just to make sure you understand. And I went over God's plan of salvation, that He loves us, and sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, to shed His precious blood and promised in His Word that if we would repent of our sin and receive Him as Savior, we might indeed have everlasting life. He said, that's just what I've done. But to see Mickey in that new spirit of having a, a peace, he told the doctors he was ready to go. He just had a peace that you couldn't believe in those days. And that was the thrill of my life. If I had to say, what's your big thrill in baseball? It was seeing the peace that Mickey Mantle had during those last days. Yeah, Matt, just a great example of when you give somebody your testimony, just how far it can go. Absolutely. Well, hey, we want to remind you to hit us up on social media. You can find Game On LU at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and even Snapchat. Hey, you can even go to our website, GameOnLU.com, see any of our great stories at any time. Well, that about does it for us. He's Rhett. I'm Matt. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you right back here at Game On next time.